My name is Neil Cooper. I'm the rabbi here at Temple Beth Hillel Bethel. And so, by virtue of the fact that we have the great privilege of uh, hosting this wonderful evening tonight, I have the opportunity to welcome all of you to our congregation and to a wonderful evening of important conversation and deep thoughts. What is particularly exciting for me is that uh, addressing us this evening are some of my own personal heroes. Michael Medved, who I know you'll recognize when you see him because he's such an important per radio personality. My John Podhoretz, Cliff May, who I know mostly from what I read in commentary, which is uh, created under the careful eye of John Podhoretz and our own Jonathan Tobin, and, Michael, and Daniel Pipes from the Mideast Forum. It is a, a great joy to have any of these speakers in any setting, but to have all four together is truly something that uh, uh, is very, very special. What we'll hear tonight is an exchange of ideas by great thinkers and great writers, people who are passionate about the United States of America, people who are passionate about the state of Israel. This is a forum for different points of views to be aired and presented. You may agree or you may disagree. But what you will hear this evening will be an unqualified uh, statement of love for the United States of America and for Israel, a sense of great commitment to the values which characterize both Israel and the United States. Agree or disagree, you cannot ignore, no one can ignore the important thoughts and messages that our presenters today will present to us. And so I think we're all in for a treat and it's a great honor for our congregation to be the host. At this time, I'd like to invite Dick Fox to come forward who will formally introduce our uh, panel. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for coming out on this winter night. And I'd like to welcome you to this exciting Jewish Policy Center Forum. I'm Dick Fox, and of course I know an awful lot of people in this room. But tonight I'm operating in my capacity as chairman of the Jewish Policy Center. The JPC, or the Jewish Policy Center, is a nonprofit partisan educational organization committed to policy analysis and education. I hope you'll take a look at In Focus, our magazine that will be ready for you when you leave. And we'll sign up to receive our quarterly magazine In Focus and also uh, join us as members of the Jewish Policy Center. This issue tackles domestic policy problems. The next one is address addressing Russia. The upcoming subtitle is Back to the USSR with a question mark. Very few people would put the question mark there. But some people think we don't need to ask it as a question. Take, take out a subscription and let us know what you think. The JPC also publishes articles and opinion pieces in the press, online, it also sends speakers to synagogues, churches, universities, and civic groups across the country. The JCP has developed an increasing presence on the web. If you aren't following us on Twitter, you should be. And you should be receiving insight and in context as emails as well. We host JCP forums throughout the country with the kind of all-star lineup we have tonight. And tonight's forum will cover both co domestic concerns and foreign policy priorities. 
it is, in quotes, and unquotes, a modest mandate to our speakers. But in many ways, the choices the United States makes for economic and domestic reasons resonate on the international state world. America's historic role as a superpower requires that we be able to manage both in a way that minimizes our losses and maximizes our credibility and our influence abroad. How well or poorly we're doing will be an ongoing theme tonight. But before, before we begin, two housekeeping items. First, please turn off your cell phones if you already haven't done so. It's the last thing we want is cell phones going off tonight. And as a reminder, when you take your, co your copy of In Focus, when you leave, take the envelope that goes with it and please consider making a tax exempt or deductible contribution to JCP. Now to, to, to this evening's business. This will not be a rigorously structured discussion, but rather is intended to be a free-flowing forum among our distinguished and talented panelists. To accomplish this in any meaningful fashion, we need an extraordinary moderator, one who is quick on his feet and fully grounded in the issues. In fact, a moderator who is equal to the panelists in the scope of, the, of his knowledge and the depth of his insights. Tonight we have one of the best. This evening's moderator is a scholar, an author, a film critic, a television interviewer, a radio talk host, and a son of Philadelphia, Michael Medved. Michael's daily three-hour broadcast reaches more than two and a half million listeners on nearly 200 stations across the country. You can hear him in Philadelphia every day from 3 to 6 on News Talk 990, WNTP. It is consistently ranked as one of the top 10 political talk shows in the United States. I'm proud to say he is also a distinguished fellow of the Jewish Policy Center. His books will be available for you to purchase as you leave this event this evening. Michael will introduce the rest of our panel this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Medved. Thank you, Dick Fox, and wonderful to see you and uh, your, your three generations of the Fox family here tonight. And, and the one most important thing that Dick didn't mention is that my late father was his classmate at Central High School. Um, any other people here who are graduates of Central High School? <laughs> kind of figured, kind of figured. Well, um, my, Dick and my father both uh, graduated in uh, 1944 and went on to do a postgraduate study in the United States Armed Forces in World War II. So thank you for that, Dick Fox, and thank you for your great work with JPC. OK, um, part of uh, my opportunity is to uh, introduce the rest of our distinguished panel. And I could take all evening doing that, because the credentials are so formidable. So I'm going to deliberately limit myself. Uh, Daniel Pipes is uh, one of the world's most influential voices when it comes to the Middle East and Middle East policy. Uh, people you are familiar with the Middle East Forum, of which he is uh, president. People are familiar with his deep Philadelphia roots, uh, with his long association with the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, Daniel is also listed as, and I thought this was particularly noteworthy, one of the 100 most influential graduates of Harvard University, where he got both his BA and his PhD, Daniel Pipes. And Cliff May is another ubiquitous voice wherever there is a need for a voice of sanity uh, on behalf of American security. He is uh, the president of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, which came into existence right after September 11th and has been one of the strongest voices uh, 
calling for a coordinated and meaningful response to the threat of international terror and the challenge to democratic principles generally. He is a veteran journalist and, in fact, an award-winning journalist. He does a syndicated column. He appears very regularly all over uh, the television and the radio world, uh, Cliff May. And uh, it's a particular honor to be able to introduce John Podhoretz, uh, a, uh, a man and a great American family that needs no introduction, really. He is, most importantly, the editor-in-chief, the editor of Commentary Magazine, uh, which he has um, enlivened and uh, re-energized and which has been such a consistent uh, voice in uh, American letters and particularly in American Jewish life. Uh, John is also a best-selling author. He's also a film critic. He is one of the founding editors of the Weekly Standard, where he still does some of the most amusing and insightful film criticisms in the business and available anywhere. The one thing that I didn't know about John until last night is he was also a five-time Jeopardy champion. So that's the answer to the question is, uh, who is John Podhoretz? <laughs> John Podhoretz. All right, the, the announced subject for tonight is a three-parter, and we will cover all three parts, and then we're going to open it up for your questions and conversation, because our experience with Jewish audiences uh, not just at your wonderful congregation, Rabbi Cooper, but uh, everywhere, is that people usually aren't shy about expressing opinions, or, and that, well, that would be true of your congregation as well, I, I, I would guess, and, and also of all of our guests uh, uh, from, from everywhere. Um, so three parts. We're talking about American decline. We're talking about the new anti-Semitism and we're talking about the fate of Israel. And the question on American decline, the first question, and this for Cliff May, given uh, the fact that uh, there are many people who would say, what American decline? We're still the most militarily, economically powerful nation on Earth by far. Uh, America actually has a military which by most conventional measures exceeds the combined militaries of all other nations on Earth. Uh, certainly in terms of capacity. Uh, do you want to address the question, what American decline, with particular reference to what is going on in Geneva the last couple of days uh, regarding negotiations with Iran? Um, thank you, Michael. Look, the first thing I'd say is that decline is a choice. There's no reason the United States has to decline. If we do so, it will be because we have made up our mind not to ascend that we have made up our mind not to show leadership in the world. And I think one thing that we should be seeing from the experience of recent years is that there is no substitute for American leadership. There is nobody else to do it. If America doesn't lead, who will lead? The Iranians would be happy to do so. Putin would be happy to do so. The Chinese, yes and no. When Britain decided after World War II it wasn't going to lead the world, it could turn over the, the torch to the United States but there is no one to whom we turn over the torch. And the idea that somehow Farid Zakaria would be one of them, that they'll, the world will be led by some coalition of forces, the international community, the, the rest will uh, rise up. We, we should know by now that that is not true, that is not gonna happen, it is not going to be good if that does happen. Now what happened in Geneva, Michael, you're quite right, does have bearing on this. Uh, right now the Iranians, the, Iran, the regime that rules Iran is the leading sponsor of terrorism in the entire world, has been for years so designated by the U.S., brutally oppressive at home. It is also illicitly building nuclear weapons. The per point of the negotiations taking place is to stop Iran from having these nuclear weapons. Um, these nuclear weapons will be a tremendous danger to Israel, to Saudi Arabia, to Kuwait, to uh, the entire region, and to the U.S. as well. This is an implacably anti-American regime in Iran and has been since 1979 when the 
revolution took place. I was in Iran in 1979 uh, covering that revolution. Uh, as of Friday night, it appeared that an agreement was going to be signed. That agreement would have been a, a win, not by points, a knockout for Iran and a total defeat for the U.S., though it would not have been presented that way. It would have given uh, the Iranian government billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars that they could use even for their illicit weapons program. Um, and it would have begun to undermine the sanctions regime that has put some severe pressure on the Iranian government, uh, which is why they're talking at all, in exchange for which there would have been no dismantling, none, of the nuclear weapons program, no stopping of the centrifuges, no end to the plutonium track, the heavy water reactor at Iraq, none of the above. The agreement that was to be signed was pretty much written by the Iranian foreign minister, Javad Zarif, and Kerry was uh, going to sign it. And an amazing and extraordinary thing happened. The cavalry rode in, and they were wearing berets and eating frogs. <laughs> Who could have figured this out? Who could have expected this? But the Iranian foreign minister, Laurent Fabius, looked at this, and he said, it's a sucker's deal. We can't go along with it. And he said, and, and from what I understand, and this is somewhat in, there, there's some sketchy, and there's some different things, but I think I have it on pretty good authority. Kerry said, well, what can we do that'll satisfy you? And he said, well, at least we have to have A, B, and C in there. And he said, all right, let's, let's take a look at this. Uh, and by the way, the French had had very little input at this point. The French, I have this on good authority, the French said this was going to be shoved down our throats. That was the word used by a, a senior French official uh, privately. So he took down what, uh, what they said, he began to revise it, went back to Zarif and said, can you, a few little changes, very small, you know what I mean? Maybe not the fog lights and maybe not the racing stripe, but everything else is as we discussed it. And Zarif said, I can't accept this. I'll have to go back to the supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and see what he has to say. I can't make an agreement here. So between now and November 20th, when, when the negotiations resume, albeit not on the ministerial level, one level down, there will be tremendous pressure on the French to go along. And there's already tremendous uh, pressure in the Senate not to pass the bill that puts increased sanctions on Iran. That bill has passed the House. It may pass the Senate. We hope it passes the Senate. It's a, we, I don't want to go too long. The negoti our negotiating posture, it would seem to me, some of you have negotiated, you want to put the most pressure on and say, if we can get a deal, we'll relieve it, rather than say, we're going to relieve the pressure to show that we have goodwill, and then we hope you'll do something nice for us, even though we're not quite demanding it going down the line. We have been through negotiations like this in the past. In fact, Wendy Sherman, who's the lead negotiator in Geneva, was involved in the negotiations we had with North Korea that, s that spanned about a decade. We gave away billions of dollars in goodies, all kinds of bribes, signed agreements, announced progress. At the end of the day, 2006, a nuclear weapon was tested. 2009, a second nuclear weapon was tested. We threatened they will pay a price for this. They didn't. They tested another nuclear weapon, and now they're working on the missiles to deliver them to all those they see as their enemies. This is a very dangerous time for Israel, for the United States, and for the Middle East. Speaking of the dangers of uh, this time, uh, among uh, those unlikely sources who were protesting the potential agreement with Iran was not only the French. I, I think about, you can recall during the Iraq war, there were those in this country who tried to stigmatize our traditional French allies as uh, cheese-eating uh, surrender monkeys, if you remember that. So what, are, are we now hamburger-eating surrender monkeys here? Is that, is that what we've become? Um, in addition to the French, there was very strong resistance to this agreement, not just from Prime Minister Netanyahu, which most people here know about, but from our gallant allies in Riyadh, uh, the Saudis. Uh, and this is part, Daniel Pipes, obviously, of the rising tensions uh, between the Shia and uh, Sunni branches of Islam. Is this a, the unmitigated disaster and threat to world civilization that the New York Times regularly portrays it as? Or is there something not altogether unhappy about Shia and Sunni uh, Muslims turning their guns on one another? The latter. <laughs> uh, radical Islam, Islamism, has been on the rise for some 40 years. Daniel, tilt the, tilt the microphone up. Going sir. from strength to strength, radical Islam has been on the rise for 40 years. Until about four or five months ago, it seemed like it was unstoppable. 
But two main developments have taken place. In the first place, they can't get along with each other. The Sunnis and the Shiites are fighting in Syria. The Saudis are against Iran and so forth around the region. But it's not just that. It's also the Salafis and the Muslim Brotherhood can't get along. The ones with the long beards and the ones with the short beards can't get along. <laughs> uh, and there are all sorts of um, fractures that have appeared just this year. The second thing that's happened just this year is that vast numbers of Muslims have realized that Islamism is a threat to them, most dramatically in Egypt, where the largest political demonstration in human history took place on June 30th. Huge numbers of Egyptians, after just one year of Islamist rule, said, no, thank you. But also, smaller numbers, still important ones, in other countries, like in Turkey and in Tunisia. So what we have are two things happening at once. Islamists can't work together. Other Muslims don't want the Islamists to be ruling them. While there are many dire things underway, including the Iranian uh, nuclear buildup, including what's happening in this country, this puts a spring in my foot, fall, footstep, because what has been for such a long period, the main ideological threat has stumbled. I don't know if this is an inflection point. I don't know if it's now going to go downwards. But it is meeting uh, problems that it just did not have until fairly recently. And they are amplifying. There are more and more of them. As they're fighting each other, as they're becoming more unpopular, the Islamists are making mistakes. For example, in Turkey, the hitherto brilliant leadership of Recep Tayyip Erdogan over the course of a decade is stumbling over itself over and over again. And every time he makes a mistake, he doubles down and makes the mistake harder. I don't know, but it looks pretty good. Uh, John, w speaking about American decline, uh, you have a sister who lives in Israel and not too far away from my brother who lives in Israel. And um, I was speaking to my brother recently about the way that Israelis view the United States. And, and there's no nation on earth, not even most Americans, care as much about America not declining as Israel does. I mean, uh, if you talk about people who are pulling for an American revival, uh, the people in uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv are pulling for that American revival more than people in Pennsylvania, certainly as much as people in Kansas. I mean, come on. Um, and Israelis look at this country, and as a sign of American decline, they look at some of what has dominated our news cycles recently, which is the fact that this great republic can't seem to fix a broken website. In, in a month, they, they announced today that no, the, this November, end of November date for the uh, repair of the healthcare.gov website isn't going to work. Um, what, what about the, the clear dysfunction of our key governmental institutions right now, which, which seems to be uh, the consensus of many Americans and certainly many people abroad? Uh, what does that contribute uh, to American decline, and what should we do about it? Well, we, di we did learn today <laughs> that the number of Americans who have signed up at healthcare.gov since October 1st is 26,764. <laughs> I have 30,220 Twitter followers. <laughs> <laughs> Sign them all up. <laughs> and I didn't spend $600 million on my Twitter feed. So uh, the American political dysfunction, which part of which is the subject of the uh, cover article in the next, the December issue of Commentary, written by Michael and me together, on the GOP civil war and who benefits from it. The political dysfunction is reasonably serious, though, as Cliff indicated, just as decline is a choice, political dysfunction is a, is a fact of the current political stalemate in the United States, and that can certainly change. 
In fact, it changed in 2008 when uh, a massive Democratic victory gave the Democrats control of the White House and both houses of Congress. And in the space of 16 months, American spending on domestic policy matters between the stimulus and Obamacare rose $3 trillion. That is one of the things that happens at times when there is no political stalemate and when one party can work its will uh, and has great ambitions and seems to be unchecked by good sense or you know a sense of limitation. So in some sense, uh, the United States' stalemate is not an indication of its weakness, but its strength. That is to say, there is a genuine disagreement in the United States over the future. The public has decided to have divided government in Washington. The media are very upset about this because they wish uh, the Democrats and Obama to work their will, as, the, as, as a lot of people in the media would have it. And you have a lot of people in Washington who are not going to let that happen. That reflects the consensus in the country, which is to say there is no consensus in the country on a lot of these matters. Sometimes consensus is very important. Consensus after 9-11, a terrible, traumatic, horrible event. The political consensus after 9-11 has held to an extraordinary degree. We have a liberal Democratic president who ran against the existence of the prison at Guantanamo who said that he was going to immediately end the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, who indicated that he was going to change policy in the war on terror, and for the most part, did none of those things. He's done very badly, I think, in Iraq and rather badly in Afghanistan, but not the way that one expected that he would. And of course, a lot of people on the left are very upset with President Obama because he has, in his own way, differently from a lot of the ways that, that President Bush did, aggressively prosecuted the war on terror using modalities like drones that are very upsetting to a lot of people who are part of his natural constituency. So there are consensus, there's a, there is consensus, where there is consensus in the United States, policy, national policy is made. Where there is not consensus, national policy is frozen, and that is a positive aspect of the American system. One of the, moving to the second topic or the second subject area in uh, our announced uh, focus for tonight, uh, Cliff May, one of the things that people traditionally associate with a rise in anti-Semitism is economic hard times. We've had extreme economic hard times basically throughout the world beginning in 2007-2008. Uh, some parts of the world are coming out of it. Uh, there is certainly a very large part of the United States of America where the recession is still very much a factor. There's massive unemployment still. Uh, there are more people who've dropped out of the workforce. And Europe has also had a very uneven economic recovery. But one of the things that surprised a lot of people is the rise of right-wing parties where there is a great deal of American press about that seems in Europe uh, to be focused more on anti-Islamic immigrant groups than on traditional anti-Semitism. Is that simply a fact or a reflection of the fact that the uh, Muslim communities are much more substantial than any Jewish communities in Europe right now? Or is that a reflection that um, uh, the, the rise of, of that kind of political party and everywhere, and, and from Scandinavia to Greece, uh, reflects something different from the way it's interpreted often in mainstream American media. Yeah, I, I, um, it's a good question, a complex question. I think, uh, frankly, the rise of these right-wing parties in Europe uh, can be a danger, but the Jewish communities, as you say, are so much smaller, and the difficulty Europe is having in integrating their Muslim populations is a very big part of this as well. 
On the other hand, a lot of the anti-Semitism in Europe, and there is still quite a bit of it, is driven and inspired by Muslim communities that are anti-Semitic uh, in Europe, and that's a very large part of the, the problem there as well. Uh, I, we still have anti-Semitism in the world. It's still taking different forms in different places. I think the most important thing to remember is that in the 20th century, the project of radical anti-Semitism was a Europe without Jews. And that project largely achieved its goals. There are still Jewish communities in Europe. Some of them are, are even growing. But largely, they've been, the, the, the Jewish communities of Europe were destroyed. The project of radical anti-Semitism in the 21st century is a Middle East without a Jewish state. And uh, this is very much uh, something agreed upon by Islamists, I'm not saying all Muslims, Islamists of various stripes from Muslim Brotherhood to the Salafi Jihadists, various of them. And there are those who would certainly not cry salty tears were Israel to be wiped off the face of the earth. And this gets back to Iran because Iran has been very specific in its genocidal threats and its genocidal incitement, which is, if anything is illegal under international law since World War II, is genocidal incitement. And yet you see no one rising up in the world. You see very few people rising up in Europe, even to discuss it as a problem. It won't be discussed in these negotiations. Um, so anti-Semitism is a big problem. Anti-Semitism from the right worries me. It worries me here as well. You have a neo-isolationist trend. A lot of it is not anti-Semitic, but there are some elements of it. But the larger question of anti-Semitism directed now and focused on the Jewish state, uh, that worries me the most. Uh, let me focus that and get a response from Daniel Pipes, which is that uh, in terms of anti-Semitism here in the United States, w we have the experience of a major New York publisher paying an advance, really, of $750,000. And those of us here who have done books know it's a very substantial advance to uh, two um, controversial professors who wrote about the Israel lobby, suggesting that American foreign policy uh, basically, American life has been completely warped and distorted and dominated because of the influence of not the Israel lobby, but the influence of Jews, and the assumption being that this is some kind of uh, an alien uh, dual loyalty problem here in the United States. Uh, should we take such charges seriously as Professors Walt and Mersheimer have put forward, and specifically in attacking you? getting it wrong, too. Uh, well, of course they got it wrong. I mean, factually wrong. Uh, they said the lobby told me to start an initiative. And so I turned to them and said, what lobby? Document it. And they said, well, we didn't really mean lobby. We meant lobby. <laughs> uh, you got to go into the mic. Uh, the, it, it's striking to see how often, and in universities and in high-powered intellectual circles, one finds a, an anti-Zionist line of thought that borders on anti-Semitic, and yet how little repercussions this has in the body politic writ large. Uh, if you look at polling done over the decades by Gallup and other surveys, by four, five, or even six to one ratio, Americans answer the question, in the Middle East conflict, are your sympathies more with Israel or the Arabs? They say Israel. And yet for decades also in the universities, among specialists, among journalists, among artists, in Hollywood, uh, you find an anti-Israel theme that is predominant for, for reasons that are hard to explain. This intellectual cultural leadership does not bring the country with it. It does in Europe. Uh, it wasn't so long ago that Europe was quite favorable to Israel. It changed about 1980, the Venice Declaration, and it's been ever more hostile. But in the United States, this has not been breached. This solidarity with, sympathy for, understanding for Israel remains in place. It is vulnerable. It could change, but until now, it has not changed. And what's so dramatic is that it goes from left to right, from weakest to strongest support. 
liberal Democrats support Israel the least, middle of the road Democrats somewhat more, independents more, Republicans more, conservative Republicans most of all. It doesn't have to do with religion. It has to do with politics. I like to tease some people I know and say, if I know your views on Obamacare, <laughs> I know your views on Israel. <laughs> mm. But you know, I want to say that, um, as I've said recently, that the reason it's not that hard to understand, the Jewish people and Israel are acceptable and praiseworthy and worthy of support by elites and by Europeans as long as they are weak, as long as they are victims, as long as they are bleeding, as long as they are near John, corpses. John, put, uh, Sorry. Uh, we, we, be, the nature of okay. these microphones, you have to really swallow There we go. There. So as, long, get, as, get into that as long as the Jewish people are near death, they are lovable. <laughs> Once the Jewish people are strong and powerful to some degree, more, have more power than the 0.1% of the world's population that they represent should, should suggest, then they become vulnerable to this age-old, millennia-old sense that this tiny little tribe is an alien presence somehow mystically controlling things far in excess of their right to do so. Okay, our first disagreement. Israel was admired for the 67 war. It was admired for Entebbe. It was scorned for withdrawal from Lebanon. It was scorned for unilateral by withdrawal whom? from Gaza. By, by whom? The, by your world. No, the, it, I, I it do got not. No credit for being after, weak. It got after credit for being but, strong. But, but no, no. Just, after I'm, 67, let, let's just, if we can just, after 67, when, uh, when Israel attempted to project its power after the Yom Kippur War into Lebanon, acting, therefore, as a normal country, seeking to adv advance its interest by, by extirpating a foreign force that had gone into Lebanon that was threatening its border. Suddenly, this country doing something that France, in itself, at that very moment, was doing in a distant country called Chad. Israel became the focus of international hatred of the sort that one had thought, this was in 82, that one had thought had been extirpated from the earth because it had led to the Holocaust only less than 30 years earlier. But, but John, how do you explain the fact, and, and it, 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 is, it is true, that when Israel did what the whole world seemed to want Israel to do, withdraw from Lebanon, withdraw from Gaza, uproot settlements. I mean, we've had experience with uprooting so-called settlements. There doesn't appear to have been a huge explosion of love when Israel looked very weak. Right, but we think that those things, I, and I think their neighbors believe and understood those things to be acts of weakness. The Europeans and the American, the liberal American body politic did not look at them as acts of weakness. They look at Israel and they have a bizarrely distorted opinion of Israel as being mighty and the, other na and, and the Palestinians and the other nations somehow being weak and pitiless, pitiful and defenseless against this monstrous you know, uh, this monstrous entity that came out of nowhere. Um, so, so let, John, let me just try something here very quickly just to follow up on this. Um, y you're very familiar with my brother's work and some of the, uh, best, uh, the best selling book, uh, Startup Nation, which actually profiles my brother in part, and, and, and a lot of triumphalism about eco Israel's tremendous progress, a standard of living, standard of education, uh, the, the, uh, unleashing of this, this uh, um, a Silicon Wadi, as they call it, in, in, in Israel, and, and the high-tech revolution, and Israel's economic power, and now all of a sudden there's the Leviathan oil resources, energy resources. Do you think it's a mistake for uh, advocates for Israel and those of us who make the case to Israel to talk so much about the remarkable achievements of the Israeli economy? Quite the opposite, because this notion that Jews should be poor and weak and suffering and die, and therefore under those conditions they will be morally acceptable to a bunch of people who are their moral and spiritual inferiors, is not to be accepted. It, sh it should not be accepted. And what's more, the most powerful country on earth and the most important country on earth does not respond to Israel in this way, as Daniel suggested. 
It is countries that are on the, on the political and ideological and demographic decline that look at Israel and the Jewish people as a threat. Not countries Daniel? that are healthy and optimistic and have a sense that the future belongs to them. Daniel, is there a danger in uh, talking too much about Israel's recent progress? No, I don't think so. I don't think so at all. No, I think it is. Uh, what what Israel needs to do in the long term is to establish that it's there, it's permanent, it's tough, it's strong, and it's technological breakthroughs, it's gas and oil deposits, uh, it's robust demographic rate, it's cultural achievements, it's breakthroughs in uh, all sorts of areas, all work to Israel's favor to show that it is there, it is tough, it is strong, it is willful. The worst time for Israel, I think, was the 1990s, when as a result of the Oslo Accords, the Israelis were in what looked plausibly to be decline and retreat, and the effect on the Palestinians was to take a fairly morose Palestinian body politic and incite it to fury and violence. Yeah. Um, Cliff May, if, if you were to specify the greatest danger of what people have called the new anti-Semitism, the, the upsurge of anti-Semitism that you do see in various parts of the world, some of it, of course, directly fomented by Islamists. What, for those people in this room and for our brothers and sisters in Israel, what is the most consequential threat comprised by that new anti-Semitism. Well, I, I think the Israelis have, uh, the Israelis I know have thought about this a lot and they're pretty clear on this. Um, they would say that, for example, Hamas is a tactical threat. Hezbollah, which has 60, 70,000 missiles pointed at Israel, is a strategic threat. And Iran, which is attempting to build nuclear weapons and the missiles to deliver them, is an existential threat. And so that they, what they, I think, do understand is they need their enemies to get in line. They cannot deal with a tactical threat while neglecting a strategic threat, and even more so the existential threat. Iran is by far the most important threat that the Israelis face. They know that. They have no question about that. And I don't think we should have any question about that. If there are some Brits who don't like uh, Jews or Israel, they can live with that. We've all, Jewish people have lived with that for a very long time. Uh, Jews, and this gets back to your conversation, are hated when they're successful. They're scorned when they're, when they're weak. Don't expect anything different anytime in the future. Uh, Jews would like to think that we're just another minority when Jews are not viewed as just another minority. They're viewed as an elite, actually, and that is part of the reason they are often as despised as they are. And one further point, if I may, and that is when Osama bin Laden said people look at a weak horse and a strong horse and they naturally prefer the, they're the strong horse, he was right for most of the world, but here in the West, the postmodern West, you might say, that's not quite true. We have a curious, um, not just sympathy for the underdog, but it go, goes well beyond that. I mean, it's almost a cult of the victim and the underdog. So in 1967, Israel was still seen, I would argue, as the David up against the Goliath, which was an Arab world that was so huge and all these Arab countries were attacking them. At a certain point, they got a strategic communications concept in their head, probably from some Western strategic <laughs> communicator they hired with American taxpayer money who said, no, 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 this can't be an Arab-Israeli conflict because then Israel is the David and the Arabs are the Goliath. It's got to be a Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Then the Palestinians become the David and Israel becomes this great, big, dangerous Goliath oppressing the Palestinians. Let's switch it around. And they did that remarkably successfully with too much, I would say, uh, Israeli and Jewish uh, help for, the, to, for that, to that process. I can give right. you all kinds of examples. Let, let, let us, uh, everyone here has spoken about, and this now gets to the question, the fate of Israel, and then we're going to get to your questions in just a moment. Um, when it comes to the fate of Israel, the, the term existential threat has been used to uh, represent what Iran constitutes for the state of Israel. 
Uh, do, do all three of you agree that Iran is an existential threat to Israel? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So what is the best possible outcome in dealing with that existential threat? And if I can get a quick answer, if, if, if it's possible, from each of you. Daniel Pipes. Bomb them. <laughs> the, it would be... Uh, by the way, by, who, 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 who does the bombing? We have to do the bombing. I wish the United would, States has yeah. to do the bombing. But One thing that I think we can now be reasonably sure of is that the, if you really want to destroy the Iranian nuclear program, the Israelis do not have sufficient capability to, they can degrade it, they can ruin it, they can, they can make it, they can screw it up. They've been doing so for years uh, through cyber warfare and other means. But a genuine effort to extirpate the nuclear program in the four sites and buried cities and various other things can only be done by the United States. And if, if that is done, Daniel Pipes, is it not likely that some of those 60 and 70,000 missiles that Hezbollah has uh, will be launched at uh, uh, my, my brother's house? No, not likely these days because Hezbollah has more important fish to fry in Syria. It doesn't need another front. Hezbollah is actively helping the Assad regime in Syria, doesn't need a gratuitous second front, and therefore is unlikely to start one uh, at Tehran's request. Cliff May, do you agree? Not entirely. I would say you asked for the best possible outcome, and the best possible outcome would be regime change from within in Iran, for the people to rise up against this regime and bring it down because they understand that they have fewer rights, fewer freedoms, and less prosperity now than they did under the Shah. There was an opportunity for that to develop in 2009. We blew that opportunity in the West. I'm not sure it would have, been it would have succeeded. Oppression can work when it's really, really ruthless, and these are very ruthless rulers we have in the revolutionary regime of Tehran, but the best possible outcome would be a new regime in Tehran and because m I do not believe that most people in Iran really have that kind of hatred for Israel if they are, not, if they are separate from the Islamic revolution of Ayatollah Khomeini. I wish that I had that optimistic view, but, uh, but a, a powerful country, whether it is ruled by that Islamist, irredentist, millenarian regime or whatever would follow it, would still find it valuable and nationalistically thrilling to be a nuclear power, and perhaps the people of Iran don't hate Israel as passionately as Ahmadinejad, but they sure don't like it, and they really don't like it, and they, there is no reason to believe that they have attitudes toward Israel that are any more enlightened than the rest of the Middle East, including a country like Egypt, which after all was in a cold peace with Israel for 30 some odd years and w from which the worst popular culture excesses in the region against Israel, the fomenting of classic anti-Semitic tropes uh, on Egyptian television, um, fictional tropes and, and miniseries and the like, um, you know, are, are represent the, the nadir of that at, in, in our time. So. There is no good, uh, this is a horrible situation. That is to say, perhaps Daniel is right. Israel is certainly prepared for the eventuality that there might be a terrible second response as a result of the strike. But as many people have said, the only thing worse than hitting Iran would be not hitting Iran. All right, uh, last, last question for me and be prepared with your own questions. And again, a, a, response, a response from everyone here. Uh, and you can choose. You can choose America or Israel. I want to talk hope and change. If you were to um, suggest, Daniel Pipes, one change that you would most like to see in terms of policy, either foreign or domestic, from either Israel or the United States, that change would be. It's so hard to pick just one, right? I mean, <laughs> you can do both. I'll go, I'll go first because it, 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 it's two parts, but it's one thing. 
first, America has to, has to understand, the American leaders have to understand that U.S. American leadership in the world is absolutely a necessity, and it is a, that's a responsibility to shoulder. It's not because we want it. It's not because we want to be number one. We have to do it because nobody else can. We can't and lead from behind? We can't lead. <laughs> and, the, and part of that also means recognizing, finally, more than 30 years after the Iranian Revolution, which was not just against the Shah, but it, very much against us, if you read Khomeini, as these guys have, most people haven't, you know this was a revolution against the United States and its dominance in the world. So there needs, and, and, and now we're also quite a few years after 9-11, we need to understand that there are those waging a war against us and we must defend ourselves and seek their defeat rather than ours. We can't get along with them. We can't make believe it's not happening. We can't pivot to Asia and healthcare. We have to fight this war and win it. It is as serious a war as any we fought. Final point on this. It is not different from the other wars we have fought. Communism believed that class identity trumps all other identities and the proletariat must rule. The Nazis believed that race and nation trumped all other identities. The Aryans, the Germans must rule. The 21st century totalitarians believe that religion trumps all other identities. Muslims must rule. Face that fact, develop a strategy to fight the war, and win it. Then. Inspired by Cliff, <laughs> I, I have my own uh, advice for Israel. Win your war. Uh, the Israelis from 1948 to 1993 had a policy of deterrence, in other words, a policy to outlast, to out-toughen its enemy, their enemies. And then in 1993 at Oslo, the Israelis made a fundamental shift away from deterrence, away from victory, away from defeating their enemies, and instead they adopted a policy of appeasement of giving their enemies something and hoping the enemies will leave them alone. Now, appeasement sometimes works. You may not be familiar with the fact that the British appeased the Americans in the 1860s in the Yukon and Alaska and gave us land in Alaska that they didn't really want to give us, but they wanted to just have you know, quiet up there. And it worked. You know, There's been no trouble between Yukon and Alaska ever since. It did not work with Hitler. It did not work with Brezhnev. It did not work with Arafat. It is not working with Mahmoud Abbas or Hamas. The Israelis have learned that appeasement doesn't work. Oslo was a disaster. And yet the next policy they tried was the aforementioned unilateral withdrawals from Lebanon in 2000, uh, Gaza in 2005, and almost the West Bank in 2007. That didn't work, led to warfare. And so now what one has is an Israeli policy that is simply adrift putting out fires on, a, on an ad hoc basis, but no strategy, no overarching purpose. Don't listen to me, listen to Ben Gurion, listen to the early Israelis who were such brilliant strategists who said that Israel needs to win. If you don't win, you lose, and Israel's not trying to win these days. Israel needs to win just as the United States needs to win. John Petharitz, uh, you're <laughs> in an effort. Your, your, your preferred changes for America, uh, for Israel or for the American Jewish community? Well, I'm going to start with an effort to say something interestingly, weirdly different, <laughs> which is to say that if, if there were a single policy change that I would wish to see, it would be the approval of the Keystone Pipeline. Why? <laughs> but let me explain why. It's not because I don't like environmentalists. It's not because I this or that or the other thing. It is because... The natural gas and shale oil revolution, not just here, but in other countries and in and, in and around Israel, is the key to creating in the 21st century a rebalancing of world power such that this bizarre little entity uh, <laughs> in, the, in the middle of the Middle East, around the Persian Gulf, these tiny little protectorates and and little family-run businesses that suddenly found themselves sitting on the fuel of the modern industrial revolution get themselves back into the place where they should be in the natural world order. 
a little, a little uh, history on the panel. In 1981 and 1982, uh, I was a student at the University of Chicago, and my bachelor's thesis advisor was Daniel Pipes. And we did an independent study project on the Persian Gulf. And it was not a subject about which there was all that much written. There were two or three books. There were some famous works of the late 19th and early 20th centuries by British adventurers and explorers. And the astounding thing about that is you go country, uh, this was 81, right? You go country by country by country, Kuwait, Yemen, the UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, all these places. They are still ruled by the same families that ruled them in 1900. In some cases, since 1700 or 1750, or they were people who were installed there by imperial powers. How preposterous is this? <laughs> Who are these people? They're a, bu you know, they're, they're, a bunch of, they're a bunch of sort of aged, rich, pointless, you know, dilettantish, corrupt, sinful, gross, How do you uh, really oppressive, feel, John? <laughs> oppressive monsters. And because they had this bizarre <laughs> geographic for fortune, um, they have been left to sit there and fester and create the world's greatest destabilizing political force of the last 40 or 50 years. If we can swamp the world with shale oil and natural gas, we can bring them down. I don't mean take them out. I mean bring, put these countries in the right frame in which they should be seen as part of a region, they're part of a region that is no more and no less powerful or important than any other. And if I can to just add uh, my own thoughts here before we, uh, we go to your questions very directly. One of the changes that I would most ardently like to see, and one that everybody here can contribute to, are changes in the American Jewish community. I think some of you are probably aware of this major study of our community. It was just done by Pew Research, which really is, I mean, deeply, deeply shocking about American Jews. Um, there, there are certain things that just jump out at you. And it's not just the decline in affiliation. It's not just the, everyone says, uh, I'm proud to be Jewish. but that doesn't include anything substantive. What, for bagels the aren't substantive? <laughs> bagels, locks, right. Fiddler on the Roof? I, I don't Fiddler know on the Roof is that. not so, how dare you? What, what, what's, st what's stunning about this is uh, people are asked, uh, for instance, one of the questions that was asked was, what percentage of American Jews believe that Israel is sincere in seeking peace with the Palestinians? It's a minority. Majority of American Jews do not believe that Israelis are sincere in uh, seeking peace with the Palestinians. All I can say is that reflects the fact that only 23% of American Jews have been to Israel more than once. And 60% of American Jews have never been to Israel at all. Majority of people never ever been to Israel. The, the other thing that was most stunning to me in this study was uh, people were asked, what is an important aspect of being Jewish? People said in great numbers, uh, pursuing social justice, having a Jewish conscience, whatever that means. But what they did not say was anything even vaguely religious and the percentage of people who thought that it was important to Jewish identity to support Israel was 43%, a minority, which is the same number of people exactly who said it was important to have a sense of humor. Right? Now, a sense of humor is important. But really, if you're defining what it means to be a Jew in the United States of America, perhaps we can include communal involvement, some engagement with religious faith. And yes, of course, connection with the state of Israel. Let me uh, then... Oh. Can I just make... I, I just want to make one important point, because I think there are a lot of people here who are you know, s serious about their religion, and you come to this synagogue, and that's very 
central to everyone's life, if, if, if that is so. There is a war inside the heart of American Jewry, and it is the war between universalism and particularism. That is to say, we as Americans have a national creed, all men are created equal, uh, we're all created by our, endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, and we believe that one should support everyone, everyone is equal, everyone is free. Judaism postulates, or membership in the Jewish community postulates a slightly different twist. Judaism is the first universalist religion, and yet it requires of its people particularism. You are supposed to look out for your people, you are supposed to protect them, you are supposed to protect them first, family first, tribe first, peoplehood first. This is very hard for, for a lot of American Jews to accept their understanding of social justice requires them not to think of their own first, but to think of everyone in the world together first. And this is a horrible misunderstanding and a misapplication of the idea of social justice, my favorite part of this detail being that if you go to liberal synagogues and you, and you, and you hear a lot of uh, the kind of conversation at the pulpit, just as American Jews say they're for social justice and that's key to their Judaism, which is very nice, it's, though I believe a lot of other religions believe in social justice as well, and it's a little offensive to assume somehow that there is a particular Jewish strength in its support for social justice that, say, Christians do not have. But what, what they will talk about is Judaism requires, prophetic Judaism requires that you welcome the stranger, right? That is one of the main things you're supposed to do is welcome the stranger, welcome the stranger on Pesach, all of that. The stranger, in biblical understanding, is a Jew. The stranger is not a Hittite. The stranger is not an Amalekite. The stranger is a Jew. You are supposed to treat your own people as though they are your own family. You are not obligated to treat people outside of your family as though they are your family. You are to treat them with respect. You are to treat them with legally. You are to treat them exactly as you would wish to be treated. But you do not have a particular responsibility to them as you do to your family. This is the conflict at the heart of American Jewry, is the inability to figure out how being Jewish and the obligation to take care of your own to marry your own, to raise your children in your own way, how this can comport with this larger understanding of what it means to be an American. And the Jewish part of American Jewry is losing to the American part in large measure because, of course, America is the paradise for Jews, the paradise that Jews have always looked for. And as the commentary cover that Michael has on his podium says, Part of the issue here is that America is loving us to death. We, are, we have been embraced in a way that threatens the very future of our community. It, it, this, just, just to conclude with this, and then I really do want to get to your questions, the, the actual wording of the poll question to which I alluded is, uh, what does it mean to be Jewish? And they have blank is an essential part of what being Jewish means to them. The highest rating for anything was remembering the Holocaust. That's 73%. Second was uh, leading an ethical, moral life. And as John points out, <laughs> most people who are not Jewish also want to lead an ethical, moral life. It's what it means to be a good human being, not what it means to be Jewish. Number three, working for justice and equality. Number four, being intellectually curious. Uh, number five, a tie between having a good sense of humor and caring about Israel, and that's down at 42%. Below that, at 28%, being part of a Jewish community. It is not an essential part. In other words, what you see here, for 72% of our people, right, they do not believe that it is an essential part of being Jewish to be part of a community. Oh, and by the way, Below that, observing Jewish law. Um, 
observing Jewish law, I just have to make sure I'm reading it correctly, 19% think that is part of what being Jewish means. With that, let me uh, uh, observe the, uh, the law of good timing here. And we have some microphones. Um, yes, microphones right here. And if people can come over and proceed with uh, the questions from the audience. Let me also acknowledge here, while we're waiting for the first questioner, uh, Shoshana Bryan, who is the director of the Jewish Policy Center and is someone who has worked on policy issues, <laughs> particularly regarding uh, military strength for both the United States and for Israel for many, many years. Um, let us go directly to our questions. Hello. I'd like to speak about Iran. It appears to me that the current administration under Obama is really going to do nothing about stopping Iran. That appears apparent to me. I really worry about Iran getting a bomb because I could see them using it, whether it's bombing Tel Aviv, London, New York, because they know the retaliation will not be that great and they will accept whatever that retaliation will be, whether it's a million or two million people. So who, who might die? Because I don't think any American president will kill more Iranians than that. And I agree with uh, some of the members of the panel that it's too far, excuse me, and Israel cannot you know, retaliate or even stop Iran because it's just too far. My question is, should we be thinking about and focusing on the next presidential election? and make that a focus because it appears America is going to do nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold. Or what can we really do because the only way, and I agree with Dr. Pipes, is to bomb the nuclear facilities there. Okay. Uh, let me, let Cliff, let me, go ahead. I, I would, right now, the thing to be keeping in mind is that a bad agreement is much worse than no agreement. And while John Kerry has said that, I don't actually, I, I, I'm sorry to say, I don't believe that they believe that. I think they believe that a bad agreement is better than no agreement. Anytime you go into a negotiation, um, and anybody, a lot of you here have negotiated for cars, for houses, for jobs, how does it work? Whoever, both sides say, what happens if this negotiation collapses? And whoever is most fearful of a collapsed negotiation is going to be the loser in that negotiation. Now, right now, the Iranians say, okay, if the negotiations fail, what happens? Sanctions are ramped up, but we'll really press our economy. Maybe the economy collapses, we can cross our fingers. Maybe people rise up against the regime, we can cross our fingers. But the regime figures we can repress it, and we will, and we'll go on to get a nuclear weapon, and then we'll move from there to doing the things we want to do in the region and the world. That's acceptable. We're willing to walk away. The American side, I fear, says, what happens if these negotiations collapse and we walk out without an agreement? Then we have said for a long time that Iran can't have nuclear weapons. The onus will be on us to do what is ever necessary, economic warfare or to use kinetic warfare, to actually use military force to stop them. And Obama, I'm afraid, does not want to be in that situation. So the fear is that a bad agreement. The other thing is that if you have a bad agreement, it's very hard for the Israelis to use whatever capabilities they have because they will be going against a West, particularly in the United States, that is saying, we've got an agreement, we're making progress diplomatically, and they're going to spoil it. If there's no agreement, then the Israelis can say, you see that? It is true, you couldn't get the Iranian regime to slow significantly or dismantle its nuclear weapons capability. Therefore, we are sorry to be left alone, but we will defend ourselves. That is our responsibility. Then there's the crazy like a fox theory. This is my potential BB ace in the hole theory. Obama hates BB, right? Everybody understands that? <laughs> hates him. Can't stand him. BB's a burr in a saddle. Here's my hope. My hope, or possibility, is that Obama genuinely thinks that Bibi is unstable and terrible <laughs> and awful. And Bibi says, I'm going to do it. I don't know if it's going to work. I got to do it. You're not going to do it. I'm going to do it. You know what? I'm going to do it badly. I'm going to do it badly. I don't have enough capability. Who knows what's going to happen? It's going to be a disaster. But I can't stand here and do nothing. And then p perhaps... Obama says, well, that's not good. <laughs> that's not a good way to do it. And by the way, if he does it badly, we're drawn in anyway. 
which is in fact the Iranians will think that we gave them the green light anyway. I'll They'll close, and Daniel has a whole scenario about I'll the Straits of Hormuz. Further. I'll take it a step further, John, and suggest that Netanyahu can say to Obama, if you don't do it, we'll do it, and we're not going to do it badly. We're going to do it with submarine-based tactical nuclear weapons, which will definitely take care of this issue. You don't want that, Mr. President, do you? Right. So okay, that's let's, the same let's, crazy let's, like a Fox theory. I, listen, this is not to leave this room. <laughs> right? Right? It's talkless, okay? Okay? Yes, I, John, John just declared the entire evening off the record, right? Uh, next question, please. Uh, I'm Ed Mackhouse. I'm like the National Rifle Association. We believe that, that not in the sitting duck theory, that you quackers say, well, you know, we can keep our schools safe by not having any, trusting any of the teachers or anybody to defend it. Like in Israel, we have uh, people all carry guns. It's the safest nation in the world, lowest murder and suicide rate. If we believe in God, God says the Temple Mount belongs to Israel and the Jews. Judea and Samaria belong to the Jews. If we say this is our land, we respect the Muslim people, and they respect us as long as we believe uh, that we're men. Like Mayor Kahane, and we have the okay. question is, question? The, the question is, shouldn't we just show that we're strong and uh, declare that Temple Mound is ours and we should be treating Jews with respect and we'll treat the Muslims okay. with respect Does someone we'll wanna, do what we have to do? Uh, someone want to do a quick, quick answer, Daniel Pipes. Uh, the Temple Mount was taken under Israeli control, of course, in the 1967 war, and uh, the Israelis were not expecting to rule that. They weren't expecting it. And so an immediate decision was taken by Moshe Dayan to leave the Temple Mount under Muslim control. And this instantaneous tactical decision in time of war is now, what, 46 years later, become the status quo. And it has led to enormous problems with, uh, for example, uh, the, the WAP, the, the authorities in charge of the Temple Mount, uh, destroying invaluable archaeological evidence, uh, banning uh, anyone from praying, uh, Jewish prayers on the Temple Mount. And so or the, Christian and prayers, or, or Christian, Christian prayers, prayers. totally Christian prayers forbidden. To, uh, so there is, and the Israelis have acquiesced to this decade after decade, and you're entirely right to say that this is not the natural order, and it is only the fear that there will be worldwide rampages that have led the Israelis to the supine position, which is not a correct position. If, if, I, can, if I can just jump, jump in, we, we take um, a yearly trip with listeners to Israel, and it's a mixed uh, Christian Jewish group. We go up to the Temple Mount almost all, all the time, and we do warn people that because of the waqf and their minders, you're not allowed to bring a prayer book, you're not allowed to bring a hymnal, you're not allowed to bring a Bible, you can't even look like you're praying or they make trouble for you. We had a, a lady, she happened to be from the state of Texas, uh, a very fine Christian lady, who smuggled up onto the Temple Mount her family's hymnal. And she took it out and began just moving her lips. She wasn't singing out loud some of the hymns about coming back to Jerusalem. The book was confiscated by the waqf, and she couldn't get it back. It had been in her family for generations. It's good. It, oh no, this is a small thing compared to all the other outrages. But for people to understand the insanity of this situation in the middle of Jerusalem, United Jewish City, the fact that it is forbidden, it's the only place in the world that I know other than some kind of mad communist atheist dictatorship where prayers or hymns, even just silently moving your lips, strictly forbidden, viewed as a criminal act. Next question, please. With the past five years, the decline of the, the centrality of the United States as, as the policeman of the world, and it, 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 what, has, what has happened is with the, uh, our relations with all the powers in the country going down, Iran, uh, which 
has caused the, the, the problem in Iran is causing the Saudis, as you mentioned, to uh, back away from the United States. They're concerned about Egypt's you, problem. You can get to a question. Yeah, please. okay, here's the, here's the question. The, 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 is Iran, uh, I tell you I was going to say this right. I, I, Egypt, Egypt, today Egypt came and we met with the Russians. They're going, to, they're going to be importing Russian weaponry into Egypt. And, and the Iranians have arranged with the Pakistanis to acquire uh, weapons of mass destruction, atomic weapons, which will lead some of the other Middle Eastern countries to do the same thing in defense against Iran, as, I, as, as it has been reported. Would you please, could you, could you comment on that? Well, this is the great threat that is posed by Iran going nuclear. It's not just Iran having a bomb, because unlike other people, though I think it is conceivable that given the irredentist millenarianism of, of, of their form of, of Shiism, that some lunatic could launch, a, could launch a weapon at Tel Aviv. It is that most important is that there will be an arms race in the Middle East, in this place where, as we've now seen over the last two years, there is an enormous amount of political instability, an enormous amount of political instability. Saudi Arabia feels the need to get a nuclear weapon. The Saudi regime collapses and the Salafists take over in Saudi Arabia, and suddenly you have Osama bin Laden with a nuclear weapon, or the Osamaite type with a nuclear weapon. This is why we cannot allow Iran to go nuclear. It is not just the specific Iranian threat. It is a nuclear proliferation nightmare of the likes of which we have, we have not seen before. I, I believe that's Colin Hanna, isn't it? it is. Yes, uh, uh, Colin Hanna is a... Uh, uh, a good, good friend, valuable voice, and one of um, the, the very stalwart uh, Christian supporters of the State of Israel, and more importantly, of the United States of America. Well, Colin? Thank you. Michael, that was very gracious of you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to see you back here, as you have been in Philadelphia before in this role, and we are glad to have your voice here. Uh, a few moments ago, Daniel Pipes raised the word appeasement, and that set the stage perfectly for my question. To what extent does John Kerry in Geneva negotiating with Iran remind each of the three of you of Neville Chamberlain in Munich <laughs> negotiating with Nazi Germany? Neville Chamberlain was smarter than John Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> no, he came back with an agreement. Yeah, By but the way, Neville Chamberlain, appeasement, to be fair to Neville Chamberlain, appeasement was a perfectly rational, theoretical policy in the 1930s. We now know better because of Neville Chamberlain, who himself understood after he made the agreement and the war started, he, went, he apologized to the British people, he went to Churchill and offered to be in his government. Uh, John Kerry has the example of Neville Chamberlain to keep him from going, but I don't know that he can spell Chamberlain. <laughs> John, Colin, I think you're entirely right. And, the, and if you listen to what Kerry says, it's the spirit of Chamberlain and it's peace in our time. And that time is only meant to last till the next presidential election. Senator Mark Kirk of Illinois today said, after attending a high-level meeting that included the Vice President and the Treasury Secretary for the Senate Banking Committee, he said, this administration, like Neville Chamberlain, is yielding a large and bloody conflict in the Middle East involving Iranian nuclear weapons, which will now be part of our children's future. He's right. Hey, I, John Kerry, John Kerry, remember John Kerry in August? John Kerry saying, the evidence of the evil of the use of chemical weapons in Syria is staring us in the face and future generations will not look at us kindly if we do not do something, and then a week later, Vladimir Putin saves the Syrians, and he goes, okay. <laughs> also, to raise the Syrian topic, after Assad used chemical weapons in August, and we came to that agreement with the Russians, the so-called framework, we gave Assad a week, a week, seven days. Why do the Iranians need six months? Why can't we just say to them, do it right now, within a week? And, and uh, Daniel, I, I know you've made this point, is that um, one of the things that Assad has demonstrated 
is just how useful the chemical weapons have been for him. His use of the chemical weapons, you've said, was I successful. Said, I said he didn't. I said it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I said it. Daniel disagrees with that. I do think that, that, that Assad may have won his war with the rebels by using the chemical weapons and then having the Russians come in, take them away from him nominally, theoretically, and then enshrine his, uh, therefore prevent the United States from doing what could have dethroned him. And, he, right, and so he has total dispensation now to use conventional weapons to do whatever he wants to do. Nobody objects to that. Yeah, by, by the way, I'm sorry to confuse Daniel and John, but all, look alike. all Jewish guys yeah, look alike, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> next question. Great, great program, guys. The question is, every pathology has a cause. It seems that we wouldn't be here if it were not for, I think, the root cause in the world of all the illnesses is Islam. So I want to ask you a question. Islamism is one of our words, as is moderate Muslim. The question is, do you, th for, believe and subscribe to what Samuel P. Huntington called the clash of civilizations where Islam is at war with the Hindu world, the Judeo-Christian world, and every other non-Muslim culture in the world. I'd like to know if the four of you subscribe to that philosophical point. Islam is by nature a supremacist imperialist religion. And what Huntington called the bloody borders of Islam are very much a reality. That said, there are plenty of Muslims, starting with those tens of millions on the streets of Egypt back in June, who reject this particular reading of Islam, the Islamist reading, the Muslim Brotherhood reading, the Muhammad Morsi reading. And it would be an enormous mistake to lump all Muslims together. I, I agree with that. If you go to a, a Iraqi, if you go to Iraqi Kurdistan, you will not see jihadism having tremendous purchase in, in that country. If you know the uh, Ismaili Muslims of the world, they don't subscribe to this. The Ahmadis in Pakistan, uh, the, the modern Sufis don't. Um, it is not true that Islamism and jihadism are heretical because they're based on solid doctrine. But it's also not true that all, uh, all, all Muslims sub subscribe to that doctrine. In a way, it's a question of what is a good enough. In other words, can a good enough Catholic practice birth control? Can a good enough Jew uh, play golf on Saturday? Can a good enough Muslim uh, not cut off the heads of any infidels? Uh, <laughs> simple, you know, That's what, what do you have to do in order to be a good Muslim? And, you, and there are tens of millions of Muslims who are moderates, but moderates don't change things, and there are some who are reformists. Now, if you're a reformist Muslim in America, which means you say, whatever our past was, it was a past of imperialism and conquest and greatness. We had one of the great empires as large as Rome at its height. We, we controlled most of the civilized world. It was wonderful. We're not going to try to impose that again by force. I just think the world has moved on. To say that in America, you're safe. To say that in Europe, you're in jeopardy. To say that in much of the Middle East, you're dead. By the way, the other part of this problem is you may or may not want to declare that Islam is the enemy. But go ahead. As a tactical, as a tactical matter, if we declare war on Islam, we lose. So there are 300 million of us. There are a billion of them. They are, they are in countries scattered throughout the world. Uh, we don't, we, that, is, that is defining a conflict in which there is no victory possible. There is victory possible over Islamism. There is no victory possible over Islam. And, and right. one of the things that's very important to keep in mind here is that there have been gross exaggerations of the number of Muslims who live in America. However, the number is not small. It's almost 2 million people now. It is not 7 million. It's not 20 million. It's almost 2 million people. We have a, a census that we pay a lot for in this country. And uh, they do on the short form census, uh, that, or the long form census, it goes to some people, they do calculate uh, religious membership. And there are almost two million American Muslims. Our life in this country as Jews, our life in this country as Christians, if God forbid we did not have the overwhelming majority of American Muslims who are patriotic, good neighbors, good Americans, decent people, uh, not all of them, but the overwhelming majority, and that ought to be recognized. And we shouldn't forget it because your ability to come with Rabbi Cooper to this synagogue 
next Friday and Saturday is really dependent upon that kind of continued participation in the American mainstream by the Muslim American community, which by a large margin of advantage is probably the most enlightened, uh, most integrated Muslim community in the world. Now, one of the things that I think it's very important for people to understand, what's different about Islam? What's different fundamentally between Islam and Christianity and Judaism? Judaism they, they, is, <laughs> what, what's that? I, I was going to answer that, that, that we are tolerant of other belief no, here, systems here's, here's, and here's, Islam here, isn't. Here, here is the point that you have to make, because not, not every, okay, the, the basic thing is that Islam is a political religion and a universal religion. Judaism is at its very heart a political religion. There is a system of law, there is a system of religious courts in traditional Judaism. And, and Judaism, as it was sketched out in, in biblical law, calls for a polity. But Judaism is not a political religion, it's not a universal religion. We, we don't seek to conquer the whole world with our ideas or with our polity. And as a matter of fact, we make it incredibly hard for people to even convert and to join the Jewish people. Christianity is a universal religion, but it is not a political religion. It doesn't want to lay down or impose political power, but yes, it would like everyone to be redeemed and to share a common faith. It is a universal religion, but not political. Islam is both political and universal, and it's precisely that that relates to what you're saying. That, that does, I think, make for some of the challenges that we encounter. Let me take let, let me, no, 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 no. Please, next, next question. <laughs> Thank we, you. It could go you. on for a long time. Thank you. We will um, take three more questions, and then we will uh, adjourn, and I'm sure we'll be available to, have, available to sign books and available to have conversation in the lobby and afterward. Yes. Yes, we, we broached the subject of anti-Semitism in the United States and how Jews are perceived not only in this country but all over the world. Could you please, gentlemen, comment on the tremendous, vast role of the Arabs in the media today, their influence politically and monetarily in how um, the, the media presents Israel, for example, uh, the picture of the week in Time magazine were Arab youths throwing rocks at Israelis, and there was a front page uh, advertisement in the New Yorker to read, uh, to tune in to Al Jazeera as the balanced media. Could you please comment on that? I would say I'm, I'm, I'm very- Quickly, quickly please. Yeah. I'll be, very, I'll, I'll be quick, but I'm, I'm very concerned about this. It's actually the subject of a, an event we're having in uh, Washington on December 11th. If anybody wants to come, I'll get you invited. Um, because you have, you look, you, you, have Al, you have actually terrorist media now. I mean, Al, uh, Al Qaeda actually has its own media. Things like Insight Magazine, very glossy online. They do very good work. Khamenei uses social media, he tweets out. You have regime media. Al Jazeera is owned by the regime, the dynastic dictators of Qatar. Uh, Al Jazeera Arabic is viciously anti-Semitic, anti-Israeli, terrible. Now they have Al Jazeera America. They say, oh, it's, but this will be just fine. Well, it'll be strategically different, but I believe the idea that the Qataris, the Qatari dynasty, royal family wants to give freedom of the press here in the U.S. when it doesn't exist in Qatar strikes me as amazing. So I think there's a real question about how the media is being manipulated at a time when the media is not strong in this country. Um, by, by the way, well, you mentioned Insight Magazine. Their article, How to Make a Bomb in the Kitchen Inspire, of Your Mom. Inspire. 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 I used to work at Insight. Sorry. <laughs> Insight. I don't inspire. I'm sorry. Inspire. I was confused. Yes, but that I Jewish didn't policy work, center. I didn't work at, Insi at, at Inspire. Inspire. <laughs> right, that's right. I let, don't know how to Let make the a record bomb. show Inspire. that jo yeah. John Podaris has never worked for Al Qaeda. Adam in any Gadon event, worked for Inspire. Their, their magazine, Inspire, had, a, had an article in it uh, called How to Make a Bomb in the Kitchen of Your Mom. That was used by the Tsarnaev brothers in Boston. <laughs> and, and they've been able to establish that's how they got the pressure cooker technology. All right, last two questions. Let's take the two questions at once, and then we'll respond very quickly. Real quickly, my question is uh, if you could help me understand the difference between Shia and also the Sunni. Now, we've had a Sunni bomb for years in Pakistan, but it doesn't seem to be an existential threat. And in the three wars with Israel, it doesn't look like the Shias with the Shah 
were involved in that, but now after Ayatollah Khomeini. So is the problem a Shia bomb, or is it just the regime in Iran? And uh, maybe you could help me with that. And I'd let's just, just if I could offer to people, um, bombing Iran is, is, a, is, is not a solution. If we're not willing to bomb, I, just from my military background, a bomb doesn't solve a problem, and it's my kids will fight the war. So like Churchill said, we much rather jaw, jaw, jaw than war, war, war. So um, is it the Iranian regime or Shiaism? That, okay, that's that a terrific problem? question. Last question. Okay, um, this week I received two articles from two different sources that stated that Saudi Arabia has already paid for, in some time past, uh, to Pakistan for all the components needed to build nuclear bombs, and that they have recently stated that um, if if Iran gets a bomb, they will have their part, their components shipped to Saudi Arabia, build the bombs, and hit Iran with the bombs within one month. Could you comment on whether or not that is um, verifiable, and if so, how that changes the mix? All right, thank to the you. gentleman who asked first, thank you for your service, and um, to everyone else here who has served our country. Um, anyone want to take on the first question about is the problem a Shia bomb or is it uh, the regime in Iran? The Sunni Shia difference goes back to the first years of Islam. And the argument was should the relative closest to Muhammad be the leader of the Muslim community or the best Muslim, whether related or not? The Sunnis said the latter, the Shiites say the former. They've been arguing this for nearly 14 centuries. It is uh, not specifically a Sunni or a Shiite problem. It is a problem of extremism, of violence, of ideology. And there are two different versions. Khomeini and his ilk represent the Shiite version. Uh, bin Laden represents the Sunni version. They are both toxic. They're both dangerous. They're both anti-Western, anti-Christian, anti-Semitic. Both are the problem. Just sometimes one looks more, uh, is more high profile than the other one is, but they're both a problem. As for the uh, Pakistani selling a bomb to the Saudis, that's very speculative, very speculative. I, would I think it's more than assault. speculative because, I mean, remember that one of the great victories of the war on terror was the rolling up of the uh, nuclear proliferation network in Pakistan run by A.Q. Khan, who was its leading nuclear scientist. And that was intercepted, interdicted, rolled up and destroyed, and the Pakistani regime has no vested interest in any way, shape, or form in proliferating. It ha and, and, by the way, the reason that the Pakistani bomb is not a Sunni bomb in that sense and why the Iranian is that the, the Pakistanis have their bombs aimed at India and not anybody else. And, and by the way, to conclude on a happy note, um, <laughs> That's, uh, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons uh, that uh, uh, among the, the Pakistani bomb aimed at India, um, there is also sort of talk in Israel, particularly in the business world, about the I and I axis and all kinds of uh, improved and growing relationships, both economic and diplomatic and, and even some military between the Indians and the Israelis. And India is a rising power. Uh, we should also say that things are not entirely terrible. Uh, the relationship uh, between Prime Minister Harper and uh, the Canadians and the Israelis has been the best relationship ever with a Canadian government. Uh, this, this is a subject of an article in the issue that Michael can now hold up by him. <laughs> Jews, Conservatives in Canada by Michael Medved, followed, of course, once again by the December commentary Yes. article written by me and Michael together. And everybody is required. It's, it's assigned. It's Jewish law that you get that issue of commentary with the cover story by John and me, but also that you thank uh, Dick Fox, Rabbi Cooper, uh, this wonderful congregation, and all of you for participating. You can also support the Jewish Policy Center. Uh, the information is in the uh, material left at the seats. And we will be glad to speak with you afterward and in the lobby. Thank you very, very much.